In the second half of the 17th century was born a man who would launch Imperial China's final and greatest golden age. In his reign, the longest in Chinese history, he would suppress rebellions, conquer islands and steppes, oppose and defeat a European power, flourish the economy and reinforce diplomatic relations with many countries. That person was Emperor Kangxi of the Great Qing, and his achievements continue to set the influence of contemporary Chinese politics. I'm your host Vincent and welcome to Caspian Report. Born in 1654, Kangxi was the great-grandson of Nur Hachi, the Manchu leader who had united the tribes of Manchuria and overthrown the great Ming dynasty. Kangxi's father, Emperor Shunzhi, passed away in his twenties due to a smallpox epidemic that had broken out in the imperial palace. As the heir to the throne, Kangxi assumed his imperial duty at the age of seven, but because of his young age, four Manchu officials were placed as his regents, Sonin, Ebilun, Soksaha and Orboy, chosen for their experience and conservative policies. Regent Orboy, however, had a falling out with Soksaha and orchestrated a coup that resulted in the execution of the latter. By doing so, Orboy had consolidated his own power and was steadily plotting to take over the whole government. Meanwhile, the young Kangxi was educated by his grandmother in various faculties of governance, philosophy, arts and science. As a student, he showed great signs of intelligence and worked very hard to improve in many different domains. A marriage was arranged for him when he was 11 with Regent Sornin's granddaughter, thereby disposing one of the three remaining regents who vied for political power. In 1667, at the age of 13, Kangxi began attending state affairs, sharpening his intellect. Two years later, advised by his grandmother, Kangxi organized a coup against Orboy and Ebilun, reclaiming imperial power. The two despotic officials were disgraced, stripped of their titles, and sentenced to death, but only Orboy was indeed executed. Emperor Kangxi had not only outwitted his political rivals at a young age, but now also held full authority over his imperial domain. It became clear that he was to be an extraordinary ruler. Upon taking the mantle of emperor, Kangxi now had to turn his focus to the affairs of the state, with the most pressing issue being the integration of Manchu rule over China. Since the Qing government lacked effective control over the southern and western portions of China, they created the Yi Han Zhi Han system, literally meaning letting the Han govern the Han. Under this law, the Qing allowed ex-Ming generals who had defected to the Manchus to administer regions they controlled. Three of them, Wu Sangui, Shang Kexi, and Gong Jingzhong, had been elevated as kings in imperial China. By the time Kangxi came of age, the private armies of the ex-Ming generals led to growing concern in the court. With these powerful men in power, the Qing could not hope to centralize the authority of the government. Kangxi suspected that the ex-Ming generals would eventually rebel and designed a plan to dissolve their armies and reduce their autonomy. One of the ex-Ming generals, Shang Kexi, was a senior and asked Kangxi for permission to retire. The young emperor promptly granted the request and Shang Kexi's son inherited the position. Realizing the imperial court's intentions, the other three ex-Ming generals, Wu, Gong and Shang organized a rebellion against the Qing with the aim of restoring the Ming in power. Soon afterwards, more rogue military commanders joined the uprising that would be known as the Three Feudatories Rebellion. In the meantime, in Taiwan, Zheng Jing, the head of the Dongning Kingdom and the Ming loyalist, embarked with about 150,000 troops for the Chinese mainland. And as if things were not distressing enough, thousands of Chahar Mongols in the northeast joined the revolt as well. In the initial phase of the fighting, Kangxi mostly employed the Han Chinese Green Standard Army and held his Manchu Eight Banners Army on the ready. Wu, the ex-Ming general, moved first by capturing several southern provinces. Sensing that he was being flanked by numerically superior forces, Kangxi reorganized his strategy. Instead of taking on all the contenders simultaneously, he would concentrate his forces on a single target at a time. The tides had turned in favor of the Qing. Within two months, the Chahar Mongols were defeated, which pacified the northeast of the country. Some four years into the war, ex-Ming generals Gung and Shang were defeated as well. With three armies down and two left to go, Kangxi shifted towards Wu and the Taiwanese Zheng. Wu, however, had grown old and senile as the war progressed. In 1678, he proclaimed himself emperor, but fell ill and died several months later, leaving his grandson Wu Shifan in charge. Aware that the situation was dire, 
Shi Fan ordered his troops to retreat south. As the rebel forces were losing hope, the Qing army grew confident and managed to capture city after city and province after province. In 1681, the revolt of the three feudatories came to an end when the forces of Shi Fan were cornered in the town of Kunming. Trapped with no way out, Shi Fan committed suicide and the remaining rebel forces surrendered the day after. The last remaining belligerent, Zheng, the ruler of the kingdom of Tongming, had withdrawn his forces back to Taiwan in 1680. The war had taken a toll on his health and Zheng died of illness in Taiwan shortly after, leaving his son as the head of the Taiwanese kingdom. Emperor Kangxi, who had proven a capable leader in war times, wanted to finish the job at hand. The Tongning Kingdom possessed a sizable navy that was capable of disrupting the Qing maritime trade and affairs. One way or another, Kangxi had to take down the rulers of Taiwan. In preparations for a new campaign, Kangxi turned to an ex Ming Han Admiral Shi Lang, who had joined the Qing government. The admiral had originally served under the Taiwanese rulers, but shortly after he defected to the Qing forces. Shi's father, brother and son were executed by the royal family. Since then, Admiral Shi wanted nothing more than vengeance. He knew how the Taiwanese fleet operated, and he had a personal motive against the Zheng family. Shi was perfect for the task. Under the banner of Emperor Kangxi, in 1683, the Admiral departed for an expedition to subdue the Dongning Kingdom. Commanding well over 200 warships and more than 20,000 men, Shi delivered a decisive blow to the larger Taiwanese fleet at the Battle of Penghu, inflicting at least 15,000 casualties. With their navy crippled, the Zheng dynasty surrendered to the Qing. In exchange, noble titles were given to the Zheng family, but the island of Taiwan became a formal province of China. Kangxi also took great care of the economy and diplomatic relations of the empire. During the Ming dynasty, a series of Haijin, literally meaning sea bands, were imposed and greatly restricted trade with foreign nations. Emperor Kangxi relaxed these, allowing Europeans to increase their economic activities in several ports such as Canton. Kangxi was also fascinated by the knowledge of European Jesuit missionaries in China, and often invited some to his court to study from them subjects such as geometry, mathematics and cartography. The emperor also understood how an efficient agriculture was the basis of a wealthy nation. He returned to farmers lands that had been confiscated from them under the regency, and exonerated taxes in the poorest areas to allow them to prosper. Peasants of the Qing Empire became considerably wealthier under his reign, strengthening the economy. Yet, in 17th century China, there was no rest for the emperor. Before long, the call of war once again required the attention of Kangxi. This time, the threat came from the north, the Tsardom of Russia. For over a century, Russian settlers and armies had been steadily expanding east through Siberia. Now, the Russians were right at the fringe borders of China by the Amur River, which had been claimed by the Qing since the 1630s. A decade later, however, Russian Cossacks leading the Siberian expeditions explored the regions and violently subdued and raided the natives, while building several fortresses along the Amur River. The native tribes were no match for the Cossacks and called for Chinese aid. Kangxi was resolved to end the border conflicts with Russia, and, since much of the fighting would be conducted over the Amur River, the Chinese emperor decided to mobilize the Taiwanese soldiers who specialized in naval combat. In addition, some 200 Korean handgunners were recruited from the Joseon dynasty, which was at the time a vassal of the Qing. The campaigns began in 1685, when the Qing besieged the settlement of Albazin by the Amur River, where about 600 Cossacks were entrenched. After a few days in skirmishes, the Qing opted for a new strategy, they stacked bundles of timber around the wooden walls and lit them on fire. The Cossacks surrendered immediately, and most decided to withdraw to the other main settlements. Yet, since the Russians were isolated from Moscow, there was not much else they could do except promise to stay peaceful from now on. In the meantime, the Qing destroyed all the Russian fortifications and left the frozen tigers of Siberia. But just after the Qing army had withdrawn, the Russians violated the understanding by returning to the site of Albazino reorganizing and rebuilding the walls around the settlement, this time made of earth. Later, the Russian raiders took up arms and forcefully subdued the local natives as they had done so before. The next year, in 1686, the Qing army returned to the Russian settlement to besiege it. This time, the town had a garrison of more than 800 Cossacks. After months of unbreakable siege, diplomats from Moscow reached Beijing to negotiate 
and the Emperor Kangxi ordered the siege to be halted. By then, practically all of the Cossacks had died, with only about 40 still alive. At the backdrop of the Chinese-Russian conflict, a parallel war erupted in the proximity between two native Mongol tribes. One of the clans had murdered a royal family member of the other, launching a war that would later lead to another problem for the Qing. In 1689, the Russians and Chinese signed the Treaty of Nerchinsk, which set the Amur River as the defining border between the two realms. The Russians had to abandon all claims south of the river, and the town of Albazino was to be evacuated and destroyed. Peace had been restored once again, and trade between Russia and China started to facilitate. In a little less than 20 years of reign, the Emperor Kangxi, now aged 35, had pacified the south of China, conquered Taiwan, and defined a border with Russia in the north. Any other ruler would have been content with the situation, but Kangxi's military conquests were not yet over. The earlier conflict between the two Mongol tribes in the Amur River Valley resurfaced. The realm of the Kalha tribe, which was a remnant of the Yuan dynasty, had been invaded and raided by the Dzunga Oirats. As such, the former fled to present-day Inner Mongolia, asking for help from the Qing. Here, Emperor Kangxi saw an opportunity to unify Mongolia and incorporate it in his empire. Thus, in 1690, Kangxi once again mobilized his forces, this time not through the frozen tigers of Siberia, but the barren Gobi Desert. After two weeks of expedition, the Qing forces managed to cross the body of Stand, exhausted and low in supply. The Mongol Dzungar forces, led by Galdan Khan, consisted mainly of camel cavalry, and although his numbers were five times smaller than the Chinese forces, the Mongols were fresh and familiar with the terrain. At the Battle of Ulaanbaatar, Galdan inflicted heavy casualties against Kangxi's forces, but due to the numerical inferiority, he was forced to strategically retreat into the hills. For a brief moment, hostilities stopped and negotiations took place. The stalemate allowed for a shift in the political dynamics. The rival Mongol clan, the Kalha tribe, pledged fealty to Kangxi and became vassals of the Qing. Meanwhile, the Dzungars sought out allies in other Mongol clans and even in the Russians. However, none committed to an alliance. As the peace talks were going nowhere, it was evident that the war would soon resume. At the same time, Kangxi, learning from his initial skirmishes against Galdan, decided to meticulously reorganize his army. The emperor divided his forces in three main groups. The first, consisting of more than 30,000 troops with about 10,000 reinforcements, was to engage in battle with the Mongol tribe. The second, led by Kangxi himself, also counting about 30,000 soldiers and artillery transported by camels, would then attack in turn from another flank. A third detachment of about 10,000 soldiers would stay close in case of need of reinforcements. In June 1696, the Battle of the Hundred Trees began. Galdan's forces were swiftly encircled and bombarded with cannons, then charged by Manchu cavalry. Practically all of the Mongols were killed. As for Galdan, he managed to escape into the hills with a handful of soldiers, but shortly after took his own life. At the same time, the Mongol Dzungar population fled to the west, but Mongolia had been brought under Qing rule. As peace returned to the land, Kangxi continued his reforms in social and financial policies. Yet, in the southwest, tensions started to grow with Tibet. The region was at the time known as the Horshut Khanate, militarily administered by a Mongol tribe named the Horshuts, who had converted to Buddhism and sworn protection of the state to the fifth Dalai Lama. In 1701, a territorial dispute emerged concerning the town of Tartsedo, which was nominally part of the Qing Empire, but effectively controlled by Tibet. At the time, Dartsedo, or modern-day Kanding, was of great economic importance because it was a major town on the Tea Horse Road, which was a network of paths in Tibet in the southwest of China. The local Chinese military administrator requested the Qing government to reinforce Dartsedo, but the Tibetan forces swiftly moved in and reoccupied the town, whereupon Kangxi wrote to the regent of Tibet and demanded the withdrawal of their forces from Dartsedo as well as relinquishing any Tibetan sovereignty over the area. After a prompt refusal, Emperor Kangxi mobilized thousands of Manchu soldiers and retook control of the town. In a punitive and preventive act, many Tibetan men from the area were executed. In 1717, the Horshut Mongols had completely lost control over Tibet to the Dzongars, the same Mongol tribe that fought a war against the Qing decades earlier. Kangxi sent a small force to expel the Dzongars, but that army was completely wiped out by the Mongols. As always, learning from his mistakes, Kangxi organized a new expedition. 
This time, he coordinated the attack with the aid of local forces. After numerous battles in 1720, the Tibetan capital Lhasa was captured by the Chinese, leading to the pacification and integration of Tibet into the Chinese Empire. Regarding the Dzungar Mongols, they would continue to clash with the Qing forces long after the reign of Kangxi. In fact, in the 1750s, the Qing generals decided to unconditionally deal with the Dzongars by exterminating the entire tribe, leading to the deaths of at least half a million people. This genocide, however, was implemented by succeeding rulers of the Qing dynasty long after Kangxi. At the age of 66, Kangxi could rest assuredly that he had firmly reinforced China's authority over its borderlands. The capital Beijing had integrated the south of China, pacified the Mongols and defined a lasting border with the Russians. Simultaneously, by securing Taiwan, Chinese influence was free to spread over the South China Sea, and by conquering Tibet, Chinese armies could anchor themselves by geographical barriers. The Great Qing Empire was at its zenith, but the speed at which Kangxi had expanded the borders of China would continue to be a point of friction in the future. I've been your host Vincent for Caspian Report. If you're curious about the subject, please check out my own channel, History of China, linked in the description, and don't hesitate to subscribe if you like it. Thank you for watching, and salutations.